Christmas, guys. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. What a God, what a Savior we have, huh? Hey, it is on. Can you guys hear me okay? <laughs> awesome. For all you guys watching online, we are so glad you're joining in too, staying warm at home. And for all you guys who braved it to come out tonight, you're awesome. It's good to worship the Lord together, isn't it? All right, I'm going to pull up my slides real quick here for us tonight. So we are at church, and one of the things that we like to do when we're at church is confess once in a while. Now, I want to ask you guys, you who have those uh, chocolate advent calendars, how many of you guys hit Christmas Eve two weeks ago? <laughs> right? It's all good. We are loved. And aren't you guys glad that we have a God that loves us and forgives us, even when we eat too much chocolate? Yeah. What a Savior. What a cool song, huh? Come Thou, long-expected Savior Jesus. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time that we can gather together and to worship you in spirit and in truth and to celebrate this Christmas. God, we can look back on the last year and just see your faithfulness and goodness, and we thank you that you haven't changed, that you are still on mission. The reason you came 2,000 years ago Lord, it's still a reality today. Father, people are finding eternal life in you, forgiveness of sins. We are so grateful that you came. We thank you, Jesus, for your work, your redemptive designs that we've been able to consider the last few weeks as a church family. Lord, as we wait patiently, as we hope, and as we have a joy that is unspeakable. Thank you for the time that we've been able to think and grow in those ways in you as we look to you. And tonight, Father, as we meditate on come thou long-expected Jesus, 
Would you please make it the longing of our heart? We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we're going to consider the song we just sang and the song you guys just heard again in a cool little video. Wasn't that a cool video? I love people can do artsy stuff. Uh, but a little bit of history to this song. I was just introduced to it just a few months ago, and I'm like, where did this gem come from? Why aren't we singing this every Christmas? Well, it was published first back in 1744 by Charles Wesley. You guys know the Wesley brothers, Charles and John? Uh, it was a, collected, a collection of hymns of the nativity of our Lord, and it's a little collection that's been really popular. While he was still alive and writing those hymns and wrote specifically that booklet for Christmas time, it was reprinted 20 different times and many, many more times since then. So Charles and John, as you guys know, they were brothers who started the Methodist movement. Charles is known as the poet of Methodism or Christianity. Uh, Charles um, wrote about 6,500 hymns. Try to put that in context for a moment. 6,500 songs. How many of you guys have written one song? <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? Uh, one of the songs that he's very, uh, very well known is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Charles also wrote that. Um, so uh, he would be writing at least two hymns a week. Okay, for the 50 years from the point he, from the time he got saved in 1738 until his death in 1788. I want to share with you guys a verse that Charles would always go back to, and so many of his hymns came around, and he considered Haggai 2 7. And that's Old Testament. This is before Jesus even came. He said, I will shake all the nations. Okay, so it's a prophecy about end time things. And he says, the treasures of all the nations will be brought to this temple. So the treasures indicates that there will be a future period of time when all nations will come to Jerusalem to worship. And that's going to be a beautiful sight. Some of us have been to Jerusalem. But how cool is it going to be when all come and actually worship Jesus? We know he came 2,000 years ago to a little manger and was born, right? But he's coming back as the king of kings, okay? He's going to kick some butt, and he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. It's going to be pretty cool. Um, so the verse goes on to say, I will fill this place with glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. For, so this future temple, it will once again be filled with the glory of Yahweh. You guys kind of excited about that? He is coming again, guys. So a little bit of background of this hymn. 18th century England was racked with a, you know, just weak religion, rampant sin was going on, often a callous indifference to the suffering of lower classes. So Charles, he found himself surrounded by scenes of homelessness, orphans, and squalid poverty. Thus, uh, Wesley penned the work that was expressed here is a hope for Christ to come again and to set things right. And for a lot of us as believers, isn't that our heart cry? Jesus, come back. <laughs> come quickly. This world needs you. So come thou long expectant Jesus has a quality of a petition, a prayer that pleads for Christ to be among us. And don't we pray that? Even when we came to church here tonight, if we're just showing up to have a little social gathering, what's the point? Our, our desire is that we're going to meet with Jesus, that we're going to honor him and worship him together, that he would come and inhabit the praises of, of his people and really be blessed. So uh, it's really a prayer that pleads for that. So Wesley actually first wrote it as a prayer, and then he turned it into a hymn. So he specifically wrote it with the intent of people to remember Advent and Christmas as commemorating the nativity of Jesus and preparing for the second coming. I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready. Are you prepared? I can't wait. So let's take some time tonight and just consider this very short hymn 
Okay, and there's some imperative verbs as we read through this. I want you guys to look if you can catch the six that are here. We got a couple English teachers. You guys are like, woohoo! Awesome. First one, come, right? Thou expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins, release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. I see why this is such a cool hymn. Doesn't that resonate within our hearts? You see, Israel here, speaking of them, but he also knows Jesus came to save all peoples. And we see that here too. Okay? So Israel desired joy, hope, freedom. And it's all there in that first verse. Let's take a look at the second verse. It goes on to explain what Jesus has or can or will do to be the Savior of the world. It says, born thy people to deliver. Born a child and yet a king. Born to reign in us forever. Now thy gracious kingdom bring by thine own internal spirit. Rule in all our hearts alone. By thy own sufficient merit, raise us to thy glorious throne. Wow. Rule in all our hearts alone. So don't let the forces of evil like greed and apathy to suffering rule our hearts. He also draws upon another, you know, cumulative technique here. It's a repetition of a single war- word here to bring home the effect, the repetition of born, right? Jesus' mission to this troubled world is re- revealed. Born to set thy people free. Born thy people to deliver. Born a child and yet a king. Born to reign in us forever. This hymn was popularized by Charles Spurgeon. He's known as the Prince of Preachers, but he made a Christmas sermon out of this, so I feel like I'm in good company. (laughs) He did that back in 1855 when he was 21, and he included sections of Come Thou Long Expected Jesus in it. And he did this to illustrate the point that there are very few born king And that Jesus was the only one who had been born king without being a prince. So its last line of the first verse may have come from Wesley being inspired in the 17th century by the philosopher Pascal. Any of you guys ever hear of him? All right, He's the one who said, There is a God-shaped vacuum in our heart of every person that cannot be filled by any created thing but only by God, the Creator. You guys who've come to faith in Jesus know exactly what he was talking about. There was a longing. You knew there was something missing. And it was your Creator. You guys understand we've been created to know him. He is God, and we only can be satisfied in him. And when a person comes to faith in Christ, it's like, whoa, this is what I've been looking for my entire life. It's you, God. You're the one who's filling that hole. And there are many who are looking. There may be some here tonight who's looking. There may be some watching at home trying to figure out what's that missing piece. It is Jesus. So as we consider this, the application for us, guys, Charles Wesley, he offers this very poetic teaching that allows us to apply the story of Christmas to our lives. Although we live in a different time than when Charles lived, the longings of people's hearts, they're just as deep, aren't they? We long for security. We long for love. 
We all long for relationships. We want meaning in life. So to those who open themselves up to the message of this hymn, really identifies with the longing, the deepest levels of our existence. Where there is no longing, guys, there can be little meaning. Think about it. The pain of loss, poverty of sickness that we have all over the world, everybody being in rebellion to God, this all has an expiration date. Actually, hope is the central experience of the Christian life. The world's looking for hope. And for the believer, we have a hope that is sure. We have the hope of the world in Jesus. And you guys have heard me say before, we get to be those hope dealers. People need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. I so love that it's Christmas Eve. I so love that the gospel of Jesus Christ is being shared throughout the world today. Think about how many brothers and sisters are going to come into the family today because they may be hearing the gospel for the first time and saying, yeah, I need a Savior, and I believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. I really do believe he came 2,000 years ago to die for the sins of this world that a person can be forgiven through the blood he shed and be given eternal life. Do you guys understand that Christ is a gift? He's a gift to anyone who will receive by faith. Don't you guys love the gospel? So good. So a few questions. Where will our longing and our hopeful waiting lead us? We all have it, but where is it going to lead us? Where is the ultimate home for our hope? I love the final line where Wesley takes us. He says, raise us to thy glorious throne. Wow. You guys know what's happening right now before the throne of God? You guys long to be there? Well, we get little glimpses of it. We join in with that heavenly host when we worship. You, when you bow your heart before the Lord, and maybe you're in your you know, prayer closet, you're before the mercy seat of God. It's one of the sweetest places to be, isn't it? And I think about it. There's a host of heaven praising him. So many gathered all around the saints who've gone before us, the apostles. There's even some crazy seraphim who don't stop worshiping God, but they're before the throne day and night worshiping him because he is holy, holy, holy. I'm pretty excited to get there someday. I mean, I'm going to check out those gnarly beasts. They're going to be cool to see because if you guys read anything about them in the Bible, they got like all these crazy wings and eyes and you know, they're pretty cool, but we're just going to be tripping out on Jesus, actually seeing him in the fullness of his glory. It's going to be wonderful, guys. It's going to be so good. But isn't that a cool line right there? Raise us to thy glorious throne. So, why Jesus came. Born thy people to deliver. Born a child and yet a king. Born to reign in us forever. Now thy gracious kingdom bring. This is why Jesus came, guys. It wasn't to start a new holiday. Oh, Christmas, it's the coolest. Thanks, Jesus. No, Jesus was born to die for the sins of the world. We've kind of made a muck of it all, haven't we? We got a whole world, especially here, the people we live among, everyone's celebrating Christmas, but very few people even know Christ. They haven't even thought once about being forgiven of sin. And that there's this gift of salvation. But that's what it's all about. It's all about Jesus, isn't it? Jesus told us in Matthew 5, 17, 
Don't misunderstand why I have come. This is what Jesus is saying. If you're confused, listen carefully. He goes on to say, I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Jesus was able to come and do something that no one else could. He was the perfect, sinless Lamb of God that could be a sacrifice to atone for our sin. Wow. All right, I'm going to date myself for a second. How many of you guys remember Sony Walkmans? <laughs> yeah, my peeps. Who has no clue, I do, like, no clue what I'm talking about right now? Raise your hand. All right, I love you guys. Anyways, uh, we have these things called tape cassettes. You guys know what those are. <laughs> Anyways, you put in your cassette... And you'd have to listen to every song unless you wanted to wait a minute and fast forward through your tape to find the song you wanted to get to. You guys remember what I talked to? Big old headphones. Yeah, pretty cool. They were cool back then, okay? But we don't have these anymore because it's been replaced by something greater. It's not that it was bad, but something better came along. Do you guys remember... After Jesus had died upon the cross, he was buried, he rose dead, from the dead, resurrected, and he met with two disciples who were walking on the road to Emmaus. You guys remember that? And they were probably a little bummed. We thought Jesus was the Messiah. We thought he was the one that the prophets spoke about. He did all those miracles. He fulfilled all those prophecies. We were sure it was him. Well, it tells us in Luke 24, 44. When I was with you, this is Jesus speaking, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes. It was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. Do you guys see that the Bible is unlocked with the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Jesus was born to die. Because he died, we get to live, guys. And it's because he rose from the dead. And that's not just something Jesus just happened to have to go through. No, it was there in the Old Testament. And Jesus spoke to those two disciples and opened up the scriptures to them. This is what had to happen. This is why I had come into the world. I want you guys to consider, and we're going to conclude with the snake story of the scriptures. How many of you guys are familiar with Numbers chapter 21? Quite a few of you guys. The people there in the wilderness, the Israelites, weren't they complaining quite a bit? You guys remember that? They were upset with God because, hey, you delivered us. We were in bondage, but you set us free, and now we're out here, and we're kind of hungry. Moses is me messing up, and you're sending manna, which is kind of cool, but we're sick of it. You know, and Now we're kind of thirsty. We need some water, which... I need some water. So with all the complaining, you guys remember that the Lord sent these fiery serpents, poisonous serpents. If someone would be bit by them, they would die. But if they would repent, okay, Moses was instructed, you go make a pole, okay, put a snake on top of it. If people will come and they look, they will be healed. Well, we have no idea until the Gospel of John, the New Testament, that this was all about Jesus. It's a beautiful picture for you and I. I want to share with you guys from John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. This is right before the most popular verse in all of the Bible, which is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Right before that, this is what it tells us. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on the pole in the wilderness, so 
the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. You guys understand that Jesus was the snake man. He, was, he is the only one that we can look upon to be healed, to be saved. It is Christ alone. So this was a striking foreshadow of Christ being lifted up on the cross to save those who were dying of sin and look to him by faith. So lifted up alludes to both that crucifixion he went through and also the exaltation of Christ in his death and resurrection. Now there's two things, guys, I want us to note. If you were to be bitten, poisonous snake, okay, the bite was terminal. And secondly, there was only one cure that was provided. Only one. Look with faith. It's the only thing that's going to save you. Look with faith. Not concoct some remedy. Not fight the serpents. Not rebuke the serpents. Not make an offering. Not pray. Not look to Moses. And especially not try a lot harder to be good. A lot of people think they get to heaven because they're good. The Bible does not say that anywhere. That is one of the greatest lies from the pit of hell. And if you're a good person sitting here, and you're not in relationship with Jesus Christ, you've bought into the lie of Satan himself. You are blind in the gospel. The truth of God's word can set you free. Open your eyes. Because guys, we are all sinners and we all need a Savior. Even the best of us need Jesus. And we need to look upon him with faith. So, you might as well try to teach a snake to sing if you think you can get to heaven apart from Jesus. You can't do that, by the way. All we can do, guys, all that is required, it was back then and it is today, is simply look by faith. That is it. That is what the Bible says. So it didn't even matter how many times that they were bit or how infected they were. It's kind of like that thief. You guys remember when Jesus was crucified, there were two other guys that were crucified with him at the same time, and one of them there was a thief who merely looked at Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom? Do you guys remember what Jesus said? He said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. What did that dying thief do? What could he do? He believed. He believed. And we get to meet him someday in paradise. So Jesus took our infected nature upon himself, bore our venom, and imparts a new nature to us. So today, will you look to Jesus and receive him to receive the serum for your snake bite of sin? I sure hope so. That doesn't sound like much of a New Year's Eve message pastor the gospel is the message little baby jesus grew up for a reason guys it was to save this world from their sin until we humbly accept and repent and believe in faith guys You're going to continue to have a void. You're going to continue to live in hopelessness. But there is a great hope. The only hope. And what a Savior, what a God we celebrate every Christmas. So let's not move, lose sight of that. Let's keep our eyes on him. So what we're going to do is we're going to conclude our time I'll pray in a moment. But we're going to sing this song once more. And I hope we've, over the last four weeks,
have sung it every week here at Freedom Fellowship. And it's a hymn I hope you guys have memorized and put to your heart and have found yourself singing, okay? Because it really is simply about the hope we have in Jesus. Yeah, he did come, but he is coming again. And our hearts long for him, or they should. And if they don't, this hymn's a great one to start praying. So let me tell you what. If you pray on something, does your heart start to change? Yeah, it certainly does. So we are going to also have an opportunity to conclude the evening. We're going to sing the hymn, and then we're going to sing Silent Night together. We have some candles, and we're going to light those. Um, and we're going to close with that, and then Steve will dismiss you guys when we're done. So why don't we uh, pray, and then we will have the worship team come up. Well, Jesus, we know that you're the Messiah. God, that is so, uh, so very clear and evident as we look to your word the things you wrote hundreds and even thousands of years before your coming, Lord, everything you said you would do and accomplish, you did. God, we thank you that you are the hope of Haggai, the hope of Wesley, and that you are our hope. God, what a precious faith we share. And what a precious faith many will find this day. God, we would pray for those. We have so many loved ones that walk in unbelief. Holy Spirit, open their hearts and their eyes, please. Help them to see their great need of you. God, we are so sorry when we think we can do it without you. You are it. <laughs> you are the hope. Thank you for coming into this world and doing what we couldn't do. Thank you for another opportunity, Father, to gather together and to worship you, our Savior. And we so long for that day when we finally get to see you face to face. Lord, to be with that heavenly host in heaven before your throne. Oh, what a glorious day that will be. God, thank you so much for all that you have done, all that you are doing for the many blessings we enjoy as your kids. And I do pray for these here tonight, and those watching online. Lord, may we, be, by faith, just receive all that you have done, Jesus, who you are, God, and all that you would have for us. We pray in your name. Amen.